Hello there and welcome back. In today's lesson, we're going to be covering the final two cards of the Tarot's Major Arcana. So they are card number 20, the Judgment card, and card number 21, the World card. So let's start with the Judgment card. In fact, let's start right at the beginning. We're going to look at the Visconti Sforza, the earliest deck I've got on the table here. So, you can see here, there are two angels with trumpets floating in the sky. They're sounding their trumpets, pointing them down to earth, and above them is the figure of God himself, holding a sword of justice. Now, on earth, you can actually see what looks like a tomb that's been opened and there are three figures rising from the dead. So what we have here, in effect, is a depiction of the Christian Last Judgment. Now, by and large, with one exception of the Thoth card, this is what we're seeing in all of the other decks that we'll look at, with some variations. So, we know this card primarily as the Judgment card, but in early Italian decks, it would have been known as the Angel for the most part. So this is one of Nigel Jackson's beautiful decks. This is a Majors only deck, uh, a special edition. And you can see that he's used the original Italian title of the Angel. So what this version would have been called, I'm not too sure. Uh, as I say, we've got two angels there plus God. But again, it's the same sort of thing. It is a depiction of the Christian Last Judgment. Let's have a look at some of the variations. Let's have a look at the most important one for us, the rider. We can see here several coffins. But again, the theme is the same. Uh, the dead being called back to life by the blast of the trumpets. So we have here the angel Gabriel. Uh, Hair of flames, which relates this card to the element of fire. And it's interesting because the trumpet is emblazoned with a banner showing a cross. Now this you can sort of tie back to the Emperor Constantine and it was the his banner of victory. So in this case, it's a depiction of a red cross on a white banner. So actually attached to the trumpet of the angel Gabriel, uh, that shows divine victory over the forces of evil. So we'll come back to that. You can see something very, very similar in the Marseille tradition. A bit of variation of colour in the banner. Now, this is a white cross on a yellow banner. But again, depending on your edition of the Marseille, uh, that will, you know, that sometimes changes too. Uh, it's a similar image. You can see the open tomb, uh, the dead rising. The angel sat on a cloud. Uh, and what looks like sun's rays coming out from behind. Okay. A simpler image in the Swiss One JJ deck. Uh, no banner on the trumpet. Again, you see the dead rising. There's no coffins or tombs here. Uh, the dead are rising from, just from the ground. Okay. Now, Let's move forward to the Golden Dawn depiction. Uh, when we've looked at this, we're going to come back to the Rider depiction in more detail. This is a much more developed image. You can see here, on the left, there's the body of a man rising from the ground. On the right, there is a man and a woman rising from the water. So we've immediately got reference to biblical text here, where 
talk of the last judgment says about both the, uh, the land and the water giving up their dead. And in the centre, you can see what seems to be a floating coffin emblazoned by the Hebrew letter Shin, which the Golden Dawn associated with this card. Now, from that coffin, you can see a man rising, but also you can see the outline of a phoenix. So again, that is a very powerful symbol of rebirth. Uh, and that's what the Last Judgment is. It's a call to account and it's the birth into new life. It's resurrection. OK, now we've talked about the association of this card with the element of fire. Fire is a purifying element and the whole narrative of the second coming and the last judgment is one of the purifying fire of God. So you can see here that the figures on the left and the right are actually tied to the figure of the angel by the upright alchemical triangle symbolising the element of fire. The angel here is surrounded by a rainbow uh, and once again you can see so, uh, arced by a rainbow surrounded by flames and you can see the sort of Constantine triumph banner on the trumpet. Very, very powerful development of the traditional image. So let's have a look at how that ties in with the Rider Waite image. And there's a couple of very interesting points on this, details that actually I didn't notice at first. On the face of it, this looks very similar to the Marseille. But the, the position of the characters on this card is very important. You can see again the concept of both the land and the water giving up their dead here. Uh, the coffins seem to be floating on the water. It's difficult to tell. Are they land? Are they water? It's, I'm not certain. Certainly the, the, there is a man, a woman and a child here and they're mirrored in the background by an identical family. Now those coffins in the distance are very much floating on the water so the water is giving up its dead there. You can see the landscape and mountains in the background. Uh, but let's have a look at the family and I, we're going to refer back to two cards that we've already seen so far because there's something very important going on here. Look at the positions. The child is in the centre, the man to the left and the woman to the right. It doesn't seem to mean anything particular, does it? Until we go back to these two that we've already seen before. The lovers and the devil. Now, note here, in both instances, the male and female figures are in the opposite positions, female to the left, male to the right. Now, if you read Robert Place in his incredible book on tarot, which I will give full details of towards the end of the course, he talks about uh, the man and the woman on these cards symbolising two of the three Kabbalistic pillars of life from the Tree of Life. Uh, the female obviously being to the left as a symbol of darkness and the male to the right as a symbol of light. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that in modern terms. It's, uh, I think it kind of denotes a little bit of misogyny, but then again, I'm seeing it from a purely humanistic point of view. Uh, I don't, I haven't really studied, studied Kabbalah in any depth. So there might be other symbolism going on there, but that was very much symbolism. I think that weight was playing with. Obviously that's reversed here. Now there is something else that's reversed if you notice. On both of these cards the figures are facing outward and the angel and the devil are behind them. In effect they've got their backs for better or for worse. So as experience goes we're an outsider looking in on this experience. But with regards to the people themselves, that which influences them is behind them and beyond their field of, vision, field of vision. That's very different when we come to the judgment card. The angel, a different angel from on the lover's card, 
that obviously calls them and influences here is in full view and is in front of them. So in effect, whereas we're on the outside looking in here, we're on the inside looking out, which makes this a direct experience. So, and it's also, it's a very direct experience for them as well. Whereas this figure is an influence from behind, this figure is a direct challenger and the trumpet is giving them a direct call. It's powerful, isn't it? So, in Christian mythology, what does this mean? You have the myth of the fall, the myth of corruption, the concept of sin, and the last judgment and the resurrection to new life is twofold. When the dead rise, they're called to give account of their behaviour, both right and wrong. In effect, they're called to give account of their whole life. They're called to give account for their sins. They're called to follow God. They can either follow or they can turn away within this particular myth system. Okay. So, if you turn away, you turn away into darkness and eternal damnation. If you turn towards, you turn into eternal life, purification and rebirth. So, what does this mean? Archetypally, whether we buy into the Christian myth or not, this is a very powerful myth and a very powerful lesson. The judgment card represents those periods in our life where we've reached the turning point, we're called to take account for our own actions. We're called to take responsibility. This is where we have to face the truth and we have to own our actions for better or for worse. What the myth also tells us is that by owning our actions in a way that involves humility, and maturity allows us to move forward into a more mature phase, into a more authentic phase, and into a phase where just on the simplest level, we've grown up, we can do more good than we could before. We're not so irresponsible, maybe we don't you know, when we're, we're more cautious about our actions, we think about the consequences towards other people. With that comes freedom, an increased sense of well-being and joy. With responsibility, very often brings, you know, brings joy. You know, when we, when we learn to act responsibly, it's funny, isn't it? You would, it, it's... You know, you free yourself from those bumbling mistakes, you know, from those selfish mistakes. And quite frankly, the further up that ladder you go, the freer you become because the universe is working with you rather than against you. Or it's not looking to slap you back in the face because it's hurt. It may sound a funny way of putting it. it. It's, yeah. How do you find the words for something this powerful sometimes? That's... And, you know, you might have realised I'm struggling, but sometimes, even with this card, I find it difficult to put into words. I can't, but at the same time, the image speaks the truth to me. So that's judgment. Uh, if you have it upright, it is that call to responsibility, that call to account, that call to a, a higher, more mature level of living in its dark aspect reversed we're running away uh, there's a really beautiful illustration of this in c.s lewis if you've ever read the last battle which is the final book in the series narnia has its own last judgment and it is actually a stable door which when opened leads into aslan's country Aslan comes to the door and draws all Narnia 
towards himself. And you see the whole population, past and present, rushing towards this door. Two things happen. As they come close and they behold him, they either light up with joy and rush through into Aslan's country, or they view him with horror, they shrink away and they run to the left into the darkness, never to be seen again. And there it is. That's, that's what this card means. Upright, we rush to the stable door in joy and we, you know, we, we rush through into a bigger, more beautiful, freer, higher country. Reversed, we run away from what's good for us, we shirk responsibility, we veer to the left into the darkness. So there we have it. The Christian myth of the last judgment encapsulated within this card. Now, there's one card which I've not mentioned so far, and that is the Thoth deck. Now, Crowley was coming from a very different spiritual and religious perspective. Uh, from what we see within the traditional tarot. Uh, you certainly see through his deck that, by and large, most of the sort of Christian elements in the traditional tarot have kind of been debunked or reinterpreted. Very much so within card number 20. Uh, no longer named Judgment in this card, but named the Eon. Now, it may look very different, but the principle here when you scratch the surface is very similar. The Eon in Crowley's terminology represents a new era, a new Eon, a new age. It is in effect the same turning of the corner and call to higher consciousness that you see within the traditional judgment card. The spiritual and religious symbolism however is very very different. Rather than Christian symbolism we see a mixture of Egyptian symbolism with some elements of his own Thelemic religion. So, what we see here is a literal birth. Uh, you see the goddess Nut in an arc around the top of the card. Uh, beneath her, you can see like a winged solar disc, uh, which represents the figure of Hadit, uh, the lover and mate of Newt. Now, interestingly, when you look at the shape that's created here, it bears a great resemblance to the female vulva. This is very much a picture of birth. The god and the goddess. And actually, coming out of the birth channel, you see another god, the god Horus, child of Newt, the sun god. Now, we see Horus here in two aspects. You can see his mature aspect solidly, but also in front of him, you can see almost this ghostly figure, the childlike aspect, the immature aspect showing that this is Horus newly born. Now, if you look, his left hand is open and empty. Now, what's being symbolised here is that the god, the gods, have swept away the old era. This is the incoming of the new era, but as such yet, this is a young god who is not old enough or mature enough to shape that new era in its entirety. So we have the beginning of the new age, you know, that turning of the corner. Uh, not so much emphasis on call to account here uh, as there is in the traditional judgment card, but this is very much the call to a, a higher level of being, uh, a new age, a new era, one of greater fulfilment. But the immaturity of the God 
that newly born Horus shows us that actually there is yet more to come. This is not the end of the tarot sequence. That comes in the next card. The end of the major arcana sequence, that is. So, let's look at that next card. Card number 21. The culmination of the major arcana. The world. So, here in the Rider deck, you can see a laurel wreathed mandala. So, we've mentioned the mandala previously. Think of the mandala as an oval space, a space of healing, usually created by two overlapping spheres or circles. Where those two spheres meet is a place of wholeness. So you can see the mandala in the centre of this image, surrounded by the man, the bull, the eagle and the lion. The four directions, the four faces of God. So if you think of that, if it's the four directions, it's the four corners of the universe. If it's the four faces of God, this is the throne of God. So who's the figure in the centre? That's not God. What we have here is a, na a semi-naked female figure, uh, a wand in each hand, draped in a purple cloth, and she's dancing. Her posture is almost of the upright hanged man, legs crossed in the figure of four. So she is what we would refer to as the anima mundi, the spirit of the world, and she is dancing joyfully on the throne of God. So if we think of this as the progression from the judgment card, if we've been called to resurrection and into the new age, the new era, this is humanity triumphant and joyous within that era. It's a very powerful and beautiful image. It is, in effect, the culmination of the major arcana. It's a card of completion, of maturity, of wholeness, of journeys ended. Okay, let's have a look at some of the other depictions. Actually, let's have a look at the Foth first, because it, it again, it looks different but actually it's more similar than you think. You can see here, this world dancer also sits within a mandala. Uh, it's very different. Actually, when you read uh, the narrative that goes, uh, the essays written by Frida Harris to go with the exhibition of these paintings and the, the narrative from the detailed Thoth booklet, it says that the Mandala shape is actually created by 72 separate spheres. Now, these are related to 72 rays of the sun and the 72 subdivisions of the zodiac. So what in effect she's surrounded by and she's dancing within is the wheel of the year. You can see here also within the mandala is the wheel of the year. Now, she is dancing with a serpent who represents the sun. So the sun, the wheel of the year, the revolution of the sun, cycles, a cycle ended, a cycle beginning. And once again, you've got the four directions, the four faces of God uh, in the four corners. So a couple of other interesting little details here. Uh, there's, I couldn't make this symbol out at the bottom originally. It's what looks like a sort of palace. It's actually uh, an early depiction of what we now know as the periodic table. So the inclusion down at the base of this card shows that we're dealing with the material world reborn. Beautiful and very powerful. So let's have a look at some of the other depictions. We see 
similar mandala depictions uh, through three of the other four decks I've got here. Uh, the Golden Dawn is similar but slight, I would say more developed than Waits Image. Rather than a laurel wreath mandala, it's made up of 12 coloured spheres, each one for the sign of the zodiac. And then you can see within that again are the, the 72 subdivisions. The World Dancer has her wands. One wand is black, one is white. So you're kind of back to the duality of the High Priestess, but rather than the Dancer being sat between two fixed pillars, you could almost say that she now has those pillars in her hand. She's empowered in a way that even the High Priestess wasn't. Uh, again, the four faces of God in the corners. So the throne of God and the Wheel of the Year, similar to the Thoth. The Marseille, I would say, is the one that is most akin to the Rider deck. Uh, it's virtually identical. The only difference being that the figure in the centre is holding a scepter and an orb rather than the two ones. So they're symbols of authority. Uh, so it does kind of put this figure in a position of triumph and authority within the throne of God. So that's humanity raised to a level of the divine or you know if we go back to the to the last judgment myth this is humanity purified and ready and mature enough to take authority we see something similar in the one one jj but i think it's symbolically a little bit more confused there are only three this you know there are the four faces of god there's i mean you've got the the lion and the bull at the base uh, no figures in the top left-hand corners. The eagle is there. It's at the top of the mandala. There's no separate human figure. Maybe you could say that the human figure is the world dancer in the centre, but it does make it a little bit more ambiguous. But nevertheless, the message is the same. Uh, there are no wands, no orb and scepter here. She's basically has a blue shift or blue banner in her hands. She's triumphant at the centre of the laurel wreath. So maybe not quite so clear, but the sentiment is the same. Now, let's look at an early depiction and one that's based on an early depiction. Uh, we'll go back to the Visconti deck. This, I love this image. Uh, this is something very special. And I think it, it takes the, the world card in a very different direction, very much tied into Christian mythology again from the book of Revelation, I would say. You can see here two cherubs upholding a sphere. Now in that sphere is what looks like a divine city. Now, whether I'm right or wrong here, I have a feeling this is the holy city, the new Jerusalem being upheld by angels. So again, if we, we view this in the context of the Last Judgment card, this is what comes after. The Judgment card is the passage, the gateway to fulfilment. The World card is fulfilment itself. OK. Just one more. This is, again, Nigel Jackson's depiction from the Fortune's Wheel Tarot. Uh, this shows the world dancer. You can see that she has her purple shift, similar to the one draped around Pamela Coleman Smith's world dancer. Purple, remember, is a colour of divinity and royalty. So again, the fact that she has this, this purple cloth, she's crowned, this gives her authority. It shows that she's in a position of transformed maturity. Now, interestingly, she is dancing on a world sphere. Uh, it's divided into three. If you look at the base of the sphere, you see something similar to the Visconti Sforza image. Uh, there's a, a, a city, uh, possibly the New Jerusalem, in the, the bottom of the card. Uh, maybe, just a, maybe just a divine city. It's, it's difficult to say because actually in the other corners of this sphere are the sun and the moon. Now, actually, 
that does tell you something because within the Christian myth, the sun and the moon have passed away and the light in the heavenly city is just the light of God. So this is actually probably a more earthly city, but it shows that the world dancer is in authority. Interestingly, the orb is topped by a cross. So this is, yeah, there is some Christian symbolism in here. Uh, whatever the case, the world dancer is an authority over the world. So this is, it is the raised up anima mundi. Beautiful image again. So if we're going to look at this from a, let's look at its, its divinatory meanings. If the world comes up in your reading, it's that point of maturity and fulfillment. It's the point of completion. You know, it, it very much depicts the completion of your journey and the completion of a cycle. It depicts, it's the ultimate depiction of maturity and wholeness within the tarot. It could be argued this is the most powerful card in the tarot. I would say when you draw this in a reading, it basically trumps everything else. It's at the top of the major arcana cycle and in themselves, the majors are the most powerful of the 22 cards. The interesting thing with cycles, if we look at this, the wheel of the year, when you reach an end, you also reach a beginning. So some people say that potentially with the world card, when you come to the end of the cycle of the majors, you're back with the fool who is about to step off the cliff again. The difference is, the fool that comes after this is a much older and a much wiser one. But the journey goes round and is ever continuing. So that's the beauty and the mystery of the world card. In its dark aspect, whew, the cycle is stuck. Maybe this is a failure to reach maturity. Again, we can tie this into what happens when you turn away from the last judgment. It's fulfillment denied. Uh, fulfillment missed. That has a lot of, again, that's, that has very powerful and very disturbing implications. Uh, yeah, it is such a powerful and central card to the tarot. If you think of all of these 78 cards as being a journey, this is the point that we're aiming for on the journey, the journey's end, the journey's fulfillment. It's a fitting end to our journey through the major arcana and actually this lesson is a milestone because with this card we've now examined all 78 images from the tarot. In effect, we've journeyed through the whole deck. If you've got this far with me, very well done. Uh, I've taken my time and I've gone into quite a bit of detail. So we've reached our own crossroads. With the world card, we've completed our journey through the 78 cards of the tarot. The next lesson that I'm going to be, give, be giving is in effect, the first time where we'll be putting the tarot to work. In the next lesson, I will be showing you some very basic reading techniques. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope it's been helpful, as has... I, I also hope the same applies to everything that's gone before. And I do encourage you to join me for the next lesson, because this for me is the really exciting bit where everything that we've talked about here begins to work for us. and we can begin to use these cards as mirrors within readings to reflect our own experience back to us and hopefully in a way that will help us to understand ourselves better. So thank you for journeying with me thus far and I do hope I'll see you.